All right, family, uh, I invite you to take your seat if you haven't already. Happy Sunday. What a joy it is to be together. Uh, greetings to you watching online. We're so glad that you're here with us. My name is Pastor Teresa. If you haven't met me yet, uh, I'm sure I'll meet you soon. And uh, we, we're just celebrating Pastor Brian and Cynthia this morning who are enjoying a well-earned vacation off in beautiful Italy. Ooh la la. Oh, no, that's French. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I'm sure they're not missing us at all. No. <laughs> but we're, we're so grateful that they're able to take the time to just refresh and recharge. And I'm sure they'll come back with great stories of delicious food. All right, well, this morning I wanted to begin by uh, asking a question. You don't have to answer it, just something to, to kind of ponder on. Have you ever felt like you don't quite fit into church or Christian culture? Don't answer that. Or have you ever been in a situation where it seems like everybody gets what's going on in a Bible passage and you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand what's happening. Today is for you. <laughs> Maybe you've been in a situation where you're going really well with God and in your relationship with him. But then he asks you to make a radical shift, which just doesn't seem to make sense to you at all. Welcome. Today is for you as well. Today's message is for the confused, the befuddled, the puzzled, the uncertain, and the questioning. Today is for all of those who have sometimes felt unaccepted or uncomfortable in religious spaces, but have persevered because you know there's something here that you need. In today's scripture reading, we are going to encounter two people dealing with confusion. And I, I'm suggesting that confusion can come from two sources. It can come externally when things are happening around you and to you. And it can happen internally when confusion is happening within. The first to experience confusion in this passage we're about to read is Philip, a disciple of Jesus. We met him last week in our uh, Acts chapter 8, the first part there. And today we're going to find Philip in some confusing situations. God does crazy things with him uh, and around him and to him. But despite all of these predicaments, he remains obedient. The second person is a visitor from Ethiopia, which is a country in northern Africa. And uh, the Ethiopian, he is confused internally, but seeking to understand. So let's grab our Bibles or your YouVersion apps and get to reading. We're going to Acts chapter 8, Echos Ocho. Did I get that right? <laughs> and we're going to start at verse 26. And we'll also have the reading on the screen there. Thanks. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Okay, we're only one verse in, but I'm going to stop us already because there's just so much to talk about. First of all, angel, come on. <laughs> I love that by this point, the early church is almost getting used to angels. It's, it's like just part of Christian life. Hey, Philip, where are you off to? Oh, you know, just into the desert. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, why is that? Angel told me to. All right, cool, cool. The second thing that is going on here is that this angelic command to Philip takes him away from a really successful evangelism and preaching ministry. We read about this last week. I'm just going to do a quick recap. If you were here, uh, you, you may know this, but just in case you weren't here, Acts chapter 8, uh, verses eight, uh, 5 through 8. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, I know that God doesn't measure things the same way that we do, but this sounds like pretty amazing ministry going on right here. 
Like Philip is doing amazing things for God. He's preaching the good news about Jesus. People are getting saved. He's performing signs and miracles. People are being delivered from tormenting spirits. And the whole atmosphere of this Sumerian city has changed. The atmosphere is now one of joy. It kind of sounds like on earth as it is in heaven. This is good stuff. So what does God do with Philip next? I mean, he must be promoted, like send him off to a really important city, you know, maybe a capital city somewhere. No, you're going to the desert. <laughs> and, and the author of Acts here, Luke, he, he wants us to understand the strangeness of this command because you've got what the angel says and then he, he puts this bit, this is desert, just so that we understand that this is, this is kind of out of the ordinary. The road that Philip is being sent on is not well-traveled. According to scholars, there were two roads that led south from Jerusalem, one through Hebron into Edom, and the other joining the coast road before Gaza heading for Egypt. And the old Gaza road was a deserted town, like you're going past a ghost town, basically. Philip might have no one on the road. He might, meet, he might not meet anyone, and he's going past a deserted city. It seems kind of strange. He's been doing these incredible things in, in the Sumerian city. There's revival happening. God is being proclaimed. And now, off into the desert you go. It, it's, it's a confusing scenario. And, you know, it seems like God, uh, Philip was doing great things for God. Uh, he, he was actually doing what we're meant to be doing. We read about in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. But on the other hand, an angel of God showed up. An angel. (laughs) You don't tend to argue with angels. And so when this angel shows up and says, hey, go take that road, you know, the one that leads into the desert. Yep, past the creepy old deserted city. That's where you need to go. And Philip, I love it. His response is, all right then, off I go. We don't know his state of mind. Luke doesn't tell us whether he was like excited uh, or or just confused or maybe just nonplussed. He's used to hearing God's commands and this is just one more. But I I find the situation quite strange. But whether Philip understood or not, he, he immediately went. And then to add to the crazier scenario, Philip actually meets a traveler on the road. Let's read it. Verse 27. So Philip arose and went and behold... A man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah. The person that Philip meets in this out-of-the-way place is not an average traveler. This is a very distinct person. And reading the description, we we can be struck by the diverse identities within this one person. The Ethiopian eunuch is a foreigner. He's African. And this is just your regular reminder that there are no white people in the Bible. Think about it for a minute. He's a eunuch. He's a rich person. He's employed at a royal court. He's literate which is quite unusual in this time period. Even among the followers of Jesus, most of the disciples couldn't read. And last of all, he's a person of faith. Now, eunuchs weren't uncommon in the ancient world and not even in the Bible. Uh, There's a great story about one rescuing Jeremiah at one point. Uh, A eunuch, as you may assume, refers to a castrated man. And they were actually preferred court officials in the East. And because he wouldn't have gone through puberty, he probably had quite a high voice. He wouldn't have had a lot of or any facial hair or body hair like other men of the time. But although he looked and sounded different from others, God knew him. And God wanted him to know God. I'm so fascinated by this encounter Uh, If you've grown up in the church, you may have heard this quite a few times, but I'm just so struck by the fact that this eunuch, who was a man of faith, 
had come back from Jerusalem where he had visited the temple. And yet Jewish law forbade eunuchs to enter into the temple. If you want to find out more, you can look it up in Deuteronomy 23 verse 1. So he'd gone to a place to worship where he knew he wouldn't be accepted. To me, this says that that the eunuch was obviously very dedicated to God. He was dedicated to the search for understanding and for meaning because he traveled this long distance to worship in Jerusalem. And he's now returning home. Historians tell us that it's very possible that this man was a convert to Judaism uh, because the Jews had contact in Ethiopia in the ancient days. But I'm just... I'm just blown away by this man, uh, this, this person, important in his court, important in his government, but coming on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, even though he knew that he wouldn't be allowed in. His desire to worship despite being denied entry attests to his godliness. We can also see that this eunuch was a very learned person. I mean, it makes sense. He's uh, working with the government. He's in charge of the treasury. Uh, But we also see it because he's diving into this passage from Isaiah that prophesies of Yeshua, the Messiah. Let's read verse 29. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. I'm going to interrupt us again because I I just, this, this passage, it just gets me. Philip, once again, he, angel, first of all, now he's hearing straight away from the, the Spirit of God. He's so sensitive to how God is pointing him. And so in obedience to the Spirit, he came to this lonely place. Now he's hearing and obeying the instruction to approach the man in the chariot. Now, in my imagination, I'm going, all right, we've already had angels. He's hearing from God. I bet he got like super speed, right? And he's like <laughs> catching up to the chariot, be like, hey, jumps in, uh, But historians, they're so boring, they take away my imagination. Because according to them, they reckon it probably was an ox-drawn wagon that he was sitting in, less of a chariot with a steed. And so Philip probably could have caught up with a bit of a power walk. But still, angel, you know, let's let's stick with the cool stuff. And uh, so... But even so, we're seeing Philip showing a leap of faith here because in a normal circumstance, you don't approach someone of a higher social standing, especially a foreigner like this, clearly someone who perhaps works, you can identify they work with royalty. But Philip has the assurance from Holy Spirit that this is what he's meant to do and he's obedient. I think it's also a good reminder to us that as Christ followers, we're not ordinary people. We can totally approach government officials and people in places of power when we walk in that supernatural reality that we are children of God. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 30, what happens next? All right, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, it was actually really normal for people to read out loud in the ancient world. Us kind of sitting there reading to ourselves, that's a modern thing. Uh, And the eunuch may have been reading it himself or he may have had a servant reading it to him. But either way, he knew that he needed an interpreter. He was confused. He's like, I'm reading this. I'm sure it's important, but I don't get it. And uh, I think this is a, a good principle for us. That just because we're struggling to understand something, especially when it comes to God... We shouldn't give up. And the most important things are worth going after, are worth wrestling with, struggling through. And it's okay to ask for help. And God will give us help. I I know I've shared this with you before, but one of my favorite sayings is, the Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. And what we see here is that Philip is being called upon to help the eunuch unlock the scriptures through the truth of who Jesus is. Because in this passage in Isaiah, we, in our post-cross, uh, post-resurrection life, we, we know this is referring to Jesus the Messiah, but it's concealed to the Ethiopian. So what was this passage? Let's read it, verse 32. The place in the scripture... Sorry, lost it. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, 
And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. This passage was a golden opportunity for an evangelist like Philip. And we can see the hand of God throughout this whole story by the way in which Philip was guided to the right place and met the Ethiopian who was also being prepared by God for the encounter. This particular passage is from Isaiah 53, and it is a prophecy referring to a servant of God who suffers humiliations of all kinds and bears the consequences of the sins of others. He makes an atonement for their sins and is finally exalted by God. And Philip, he took advantage of this opportunity to explain the good news and how Jesus Christ fulfilled Isaiah's prophecies. And once again, I think there's a practical tip in here for us that when we share the good news, let's start where the person's at. Let's start with their questions. Instead of going, hey, let me tell you about my Jesus. Be like, what do you want to know? What are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with? What are the big questions that you have? And then we can come and show how the truth of Jesus applies to that person's concerns. Let's keep reading. Verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said... I ask of you, of whom does this, does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. The scholars tell us that the phrase in verse 35 when it says that Philip opened his mouth is, is used in this way for a significant or weighty utterance. So even as Philip is explaining this passage and preaching about Jesus, he's doing it with the weight of Holy Spirit on it. He's doing it through the leading of the Lord. Verse 36. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God just going to footnote verse 37. Some of your Bible translations don't include it. Uh, Some people believe it was added later to kind of give uh, like a teaching instruction of what do I have to do to be baptized? And here it is, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch replies, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So we don't know if this is exact transcript of what happened, but there's the assumption that the eunuch accepted Jesus as his Lord. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. So cool. Just in the desert, as you do. The God who the Ethiopian had believed in and sought to know, the God who had caused him to take this pilgrimage, met him in a powerful way on this desert road. I think it's kind of cool that it wasn't in the temple where God met him, but it was on his journey home. You know, I I don't even know what his feelings would have been in that moment. Maybe he was like, maybe I didn't get what I came for. But God was like, just you wait. I see you. I got you. You're about to have an encounter. Don't give up. So even though he wasn't accepted in the temple, even though he didn't understand the passage of scripture he was reading, the Ethiopian persevered in his pursuit of knowing God. And the result was he gave his life to Jesus after a God-ordained encounter. We're going to meet this Ethiopian in heaven. That's going to be so cool. I can't wait. And we know that this moment forever changed him. Let's read verse 39 and 40. Now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I believe that that when the eunuch was baptized in water, he also received baptism with the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Brian talked about that last week. The reason I I think he was baptized with the Spirit as well as with water is for two reasons. One is a translation issue with the Greek that could actually read, uh, if we were to translate it in this way, the Holy Spirit fell upon the eunuch, but the Lord caught up Philip. But the second reason I believe he was baptized in the Holy Spirit is the attitude and posture 
after he comes out of the water. He comes out rejoicing. He goes on his way rejoicing. And this is the same attitude that we read about that resulted from Philip's ministry and preaching in that city in Samaria from Acts 8.8. There was great joy in that city. A sign of being filled with Holy Spirit is that we're full of joy. You think I'm like this naturally? No, this is Jesus. <laughs> and it's okay to have a bad day, but my default is Jesus. <laughs> ah, praise God. And can we, can we not gloss over uh, Philip being teleported? Come on. Like... One minute you're being introduced to King Jesus as your saviour, and the next thing you know, the guy baptising you is, is being teleported away. Hopefully he'd lifted him up out of the water first. because. I... <laughs> but and then again, you know, that, that actually sounds about right. I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on. Life with Jesus is so cool. Am I right? I mean, movies are great, but like this is the real deal. And what does Philip do? Well, he just takes it in stride and goes right on preaching about Jesus everywhere he goes. In situations out of our control, Philip teaches us that obedience is better than understanding. I mean, God's okay with us understanding, but sometimes we, we don't figure things out till later. He's like, Desert Road? Oh, I don't understand, but okay. Oh, okay, now I get it. You know, teleported? What? Where am I? Oh, well, just keep telling people about Jesus. Oh, okay, now I get it. And what about the Ethiopian? Well, here was a person who wasn't accepted in the religious spaces of his own religion. And yet he continued to seek. He knew that there was something there. And God doesn't want us to seek after religion, but he does want us to seek after him. And I'm sorry if you've been in spaces where you've been hurt by religion but, or by people who have claimed to represent God. And I, I'm sorry if this has ever been that space for you. I ask your forgiveness. And on behalf of any church person, I ask your forgiveness. It's not, it's not what God wants. And thank you for, for sticking with it. Thank you for coming back. And the great thing is that, that God, he, he's not worried if we're confused or we don't get it. And he's certainly not bothered if you feel like you, you're not accepted in the mainstream, even the mainstream of, of church culture. That's okay. What we see here is, is for this Ethiopian, the result of this encounter is that he, he no longer was confused. He left rejoicing. Of all of his identities, African, eunuch, educated, his most important one now is Christ follower, child of God. Come on. That supersedes it all. And Philip, well, he left the encounter supernaturally, as you do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it one day. I, I, I tell you, forget jet lag, forget 30 hours on a plane. It's like, Lord, I'm ready to go. And, and Philip, he didn't even miss a beat. He's just like, boom, I'm in a new place. All right, let me preach every place my feet lands. God's detour didn't deter him from his primary calling of being a witness of Jesus, of being a sent one. Philip, this, this man who had originally been chosen to handle food dis distribution. We've got some food distributors in their house today. You better watch out. You might be about to be sent on mission somewhere. He ended up doing large-scale evangelism in hostile territory in Samaria. And yet he was equally at ease with just one-on-one, -on -one, person to person evangelism in the desert. And because of Philip's obedience, he met this Ethiopian this, this incredibly important man who was in charge of the treasury of Ethiopia. And the Ethiopian's conversion brought the good news about Jesus into another country and into the power structures of a foreign government. And there, the Christian church in Ethiopia is alive and well today. I met an Ethiopian in Montana who was a believer. Crazy. Just amazing. Praise God. What is interesting, though, is that Ethiopia in Mediterranean legends and mythical geography was always represented as the end of the earth. Hmm, that sounds familiar to something we read in Acts chapter 1, right? 
This is the beginning of the fulfillment of not just you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but now we're getting to the ends of the earth, or at least the ends of the earth that these people knew about. So next time you're in a situation you don't understand or you're experiencing confusion within, remember there's no limit to what God can do with someone who is seeking after him. And who is obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading. And who knows, maybe angels. Teleportation and much rejoicing will be part of your story. Enjoy your time in Table Talk.